Missouri right now. The arraignment underway for the man charged with shooting 16-year-old Ralph Yarl. 84-year-old Andrew Lester is accused of assault in the first degree and armed criminal action. He pleaded not guilty. Lester, the defendant, did tell the police he shot the teen last week because he thought he was trying to break into his home. Yarl was actually picking up his twin brothers from a friend's house when he showed up at the wrong address. Today, the family attorney tweeted out this picture saying, Ralph is home and recovering. He said how the bullet in his head did not cause more damage is truly a miracle. Still with us, state and federal litigator Remy Spencer and trial attorney Holly Davis. Um, it's a horrible story and thankfully he survived. Easily could not have been the case. Remy, let me start with you because this has quickly become a discussion about race, an investigation to determine whether or not race played a role. How does an investigation address that in general when there's an allegation like this? Th that's a really great question. Any kind of hate crime is so difficult to prove because you have to get into the mind of the defendant. You have to prove what was in his or her mind. And in this case, we've seen such a public outcry because what a tragedy. It's hard, as his mother said in that clip you just played, to look at this young boy's face and understand how anybody could be afraid of that face. And it seems, although I wouldn't want to be the prosecutor that had to prove it, it seems like this was about race. Although the defendant's attorneys have come forward and said um, that he was afraid based on his age and he wasn't expecting someone there, um, you know, it's, it's just hard to imagine how something like this could happen but for race. So it's going to be very hard if they choose to prosecute this as a hate crime. I know they haven't charged it as a hate crime and the defendant is facing up to life in prison based on the charges that are already in place. Um, but I think that from the court of public opinion, we can all look at what's happened here and say, this is about race and, and guns. So uh, it's an important case and it's sparking a very important conversation. Um, but it's just such a sad situation. Yeah, absolutely. And again, thank goodness he survived. We're going to talk about in a moment what that did to him, though. But I want to ask you, Holly, if you think the criminal charges that this man is currently facing are appropriate at this time from what we know. The first is first degree assault and armed criminal action. Those two are the charges uh, against him. Do you think those are appropriate based again on what we know at this point in time? Yes, because I do think that the prosecution has made a great decision to uh, elevate the charge uh, away from a, just a hate crime, which is usually used to enhance like a lower level crime or a misdemeanor. So I think the fact that this defendant is facing potentially life in prison is appropriate. And I think the real issue here that we're noticing is that this investigation could ask how limited the interaction was between Jarl and this defendant to prove that it was a racist motivation. I think these stand your ground defenses, these laws and these standards States, about 35 states in the country that allow people to um, shoot someone on their porch or even outside of their home, as we saw in the Trayvon Martin case, are in need of adjustment because I think these stand your ground policies and laws are a pretext for racism, meaning that one can be subjectively fearful because of the color of the skin of the person that they've shot. I'm not allowed to go into an HEB or a grocery store and shoot every, uh, you know, Asian American person there because I'm afraid of Asian Americans, that's not really a stand your ground defense. Yet here we anticipate that this defendant is going to claim he was so fearful and he was standing his ground under the castle doctrine of his state that he was allowed to shoot this poor 16 year old boy in the head and then after he fell on the ground. So I think that this is going to be a race, racially motivated charge. This is going to be, an, it should be an investigation into racism or the fear about the, the victim's color of skin. And I think that ultimately it should lead to a conversation about these stand your grand defenses as pretext for racism. Let's call it what it is.
And I do think you're right. It's going to lead that discussion, that conversation, probably all over the world. Now, we also have to wait and find out exactly, to your points, what was transpiring when he was on the porch? Was there anything? Because you're right. You have to think about how the defendant was feeling what he thought was happening, um, but doesn't take away from any of the egregious nature of the injuries to this young man. Now, his aunt spoke about the injury and what else it caused, but I want to share this fact that's been reported by several sources. The aunt did begin a GoFundMe in order to provide for medical expenses for the victim, Ralph, as well as college expenses, and that, in three days, has raised a little more than $3 million. But there's a point that this isn't just about the physical injuries to him as the victim. Let's listen to what else his aunt had to say. He is doing well, you know, he's doing well. Considering everything that he has been through in, what, less than a week, there's a major part of Ralph that died on Thursday. And basically, right now, is just recovery and healing and processing and trying to understand everything that is happening. A lot of the pain that we deal with is internal, emotional, mental, and that's the worst one to heal. 